Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm here in Galesburg, Illinois, visiting Simpson & Company, and visiting Simpson Limited, sorry, and uh, discovered a very cool project going on down in the basement. There are, how many German trainers do we have down here? 1,200 rifles down here. That's a shitload of trainers. All 22s. Yep. Well, four millimeters near rifles. Too. Okay. And you are Nicole, and you're the one curating this effectively big private museum. Correct. And Correct. working on turning it into a gigantic, awesome record. A gigantic, awesome gun porn history data reference book, yes. So this started out as kind of a, a collection passion of Bob Simpson, Robert mm -hmm. Simpson. Mm -hmm. um, he assembled this huge collection of rifles, and I take it he was putting together notes for a book, but it wasn't really the, the kind of guy to be the right one to assemble and publish it. Correct. And Correct. that's what you're doing. Correct, yes. There's a, back in the 60s when he first started collecting these rifles, he would pick them up. Wow, they've got Nazi marks on them. What is this? What is this? And it's just a 22? Well, it's cheap. Sure, I'll grab that one up. And then he found out that he was picking them off gun show tables with a couple other guys. And then they started combining their minds and combining their research. And, and a couple of these other guys already had little manuscripts or little type-ups, or they belonged to little carabiner networks and so on and so forth. And then Robert, being a big passion of his, started collecting the literature, the documents, okay. the you Photos, name it. All the accessories. The, yes, yeah. all the accessories, everything to go with it. And it's grown into a full loan supported <laughs> museum of yeah. data and and it outgrew its original um, it, it, there's so much information that has come to light and been drawn in through his interest and in putting the word out there that he's interested in these that it's the contributors have just been flooding in but then it's been a big task of turning it from just like a gun porn book into a full-fledged history and reference book. Right. That's one of the, the hurdles of this for anyone who just has, you know, one that their grandfather brought back from the war, is there is no big reference book about Mauser or about 22 trainers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, do, you know, tons of documentation and great books on military, you know, 8 millimeter Mauser rifles, mm -hmm. the, the K98s, but not so much on trainers. Not so much on trainers, not the little 22s. Right. Well, there will be. Yeah. Well, <laughs> come to find out, these these little 22s, what America thinks, and what Americans thought of as a tool to go shoot squirrels and rabbits and everything else, these were the cover for rearming and training a whole nation. So, I don't think a lot of Americans recognize, or even a lot of people in general, recognize just how significant 22 caliber target shooting was in Germany in the lead up to World War II. It was the social event. It was the pastime. You know, people, okay, so we get together for a barbecue. Let's uh, go watch a show or something. Well, it was a big pastime. I got all the photos to prove it and literature. And I mean, they had annual monthly shooting events, and shooting clubs that have been established since the 11th century. And it was the thing to do. You know, it's too bad they were Nazis because that sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> they weren't, well, but not see now everything wasn't Nazified okay. until Hitler came in, and all of a sudden once Hitler's influence came in, then everything started turning into a secret covert operation right before the eyes of everyone. And and what an easy transition to do, you know, if if let's say we have a cell phone and I have some little stupid flip phone, but the army's using smartphones or this one type of phone, well. If I want everybody in the nation to eventually fight for the pride and rebuilding of a nation after, you know, the depths of depression in World War II, well, let's give them all that military-style phone. So that's what happened with all these rifles that have been used for centuries. Is well now not now that it was. It's genius. It's it really is. It's genius to take the one standardized rifle that they're only allowed to have 100,000 of, mm -hmm. only 100,000 troops, but let's turn the whole country into learning how to use our, our small stash of guns and be trained by our small stash of people. So I pulled one of these 
off the rack, not quite at random, but it, as, as you pointed out, and this is something I noticed when I picked it up, but I hadn't paid attention to before, this is a very accurate functional duplicate of a car 98. It's, it's the his baby weight, brother. Yeah, the weight is the same, the physical size is the same. You know, it's got the same size rear sight here, but instead of being graduated from you know 100 out to 1,000 or 1,200, it's graduated in 25 meter increments. That's right. So 22. It, you got but everything the tangent except the sight, the, the tangent sight. That's right. Everything yeah. everything is there. The the how to how to load, how to unload, how to even how to, to use the bayonet, how to disassemble, how to yes. And you you're, you're saying there's such a close match that a lot of parts interchange. Absolutely. Absolutely. The designers, Mauser designed, it's a Mauser 98K design. Mm -hmm. Mauser was in charge of these. Mauser had their hand in these. Mauser was put in charge of delegating who would make these, who wanted a piece of the pie of, of And this was a, this. a significant opportunity for the, the long-standing arms companies like that to actually have some business and make some money during the, the tail end of the Depression when Germany was prohibited from rearming militarily. Correct, correct, because everybody wanted a piece of the action. And if you weren't on board with making these and you were an arms maker, then are you Jewish? And the Jews that were, you know, Simpson, mm -hmm. they were one of the only companies allowed to make right. you know, military these rifles arms. and military arms. You know, after a while it was, okay, but are you going to make our standardized? And they're like, well, so they didn't push you know, they, they ended up coming out with a standardized model called the Deutsche Sport Model, or we call it the DSM. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a huge push for Simpson to make the DSM. They got on board with it, they started making it, but they were also pushing along another model because it was more cost effective. Well, that's really smart. However, it was like, well, why aren't you on board? Oh, that's right, you're Jews. Well, then they take over, and then they start doing exactly what they wanted, you know, kiss the power to bees butts to, yes, we'll do exactly what you say, and they followed it all the way up to the end when they were bombed out, and all the numbers were counted. Yeah. So what, it, it, elephant in the room here, we don't have a lot of, frankly, men in the shooting industry, in the shooting world who are as passionate about something as you are about this, and far fewer women. What, what got you interested I mean, just talking to you, maybe not, it may not be evident from the few minutes we've had on camera, but talking to you all day today, you're, you're really into this. You, yeah. Yeah, this is a cool thing. This is the bee's knees. <laughs> yeah, what, what got you interested in, in German training? Uh, well, Robert's passion, you know, it's nothing like learning something from somebody who is passionate about it. You know, you can, they're... It's not just passe, oh, da 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 or if it was, oh, that's a Nazi mark. Really, a Nazi mark? What's that about? And I was always interested in just the psychology of the Nazis, how they could do this, how they could do that, and what better than, you know, concentration camp liberation videos to say, oh, my gosh. And then once I learned that, is this a goose law? Uh, this is a Walther with an NSDAP mark. Okay. Oh, like, here's a goose law. Maybe not this exact one. It was a little bit later, but concentration camp prisoners assembled this one. The manufacturer who was, you know, the Gauleiter, he had about four different titles in the Nazi party, just uh, a, a, a monopoly guy. He mm -hmm. wanted a total monopoly of the area. He also wanted a piece of that free labor, which was up for grabs. So what does he do? He, sent, he builds a little, a little assembly spot five miles up the road at Buchenwald concentration camp and they're put together by them too and the quality goes down you can right. tell like with the Walter KKW mm -hmm. Walter Klein Caliber Verspurs Gewehr this is the latter model there's progression of how to get it closer to the 98k and the quality of a Walter KKW is great I love it's taking it out yeah. I love taking this one out and shooting it and however you get later in the war in the concentration camp assembled guns and the quality starts going down and Walter didn't want the quality to go down so they bowed out and the monopoly guy put them, had them put together at the concentration camp now that was intriguing to me I was like wow 
Okay. Who else did that? And I haven't found that anybody else has done that, but the evidence well, is on the guns. The guns tell the story, and I have the data. The other cool thing, I think, is you've got... Um, these have a much more personal touch to them many times than the military rifles, because they were, they were individually owned. People had these as personal guns before the war, and they spent an awful lot of time with... But you were talking about how, how popular shooting sports were in Germany. And you'll find very much individualized guns with names and locations engraved on them. Mm -hmm. um, Initials, their little group, like the Boy Scout or the Hitler Youth group numbers on them. You can see if they were put in a rack and stored at the rack or if they're in pristine condition. You can bet that a civilian had purchased one right. for his barbecues every weekend to go out shooting with his buddies. And it wouldn't have all those rack marks, but they were still personal. And you showed me a couple that were engraved that were actually won as trophies in shooting matches. They were matches. given out as prizes, absolutely. Because these were, everybody wanted one, but still at the time it was like 60 Reichsmarks in order to, I mean, that's a month's pay. So it, They're extremely high right. quality and then, guns. And this one, and the nice part about this 22 is it's really cost effective ammo. Yep. And you could take it, you could shoot it on the weekends, you could shoot squirrels with it, all that sort of stuff, but also this one rifle, 10 guys pitched in and bought this one rifle, they all got the benefits of it. And they could yep. all train, which they had to do. It was mandatory to be shooting these if you were a Nazi sympathizer. Okay. If you were part of the Nazi, if you were on board. And if not... Yeah, you don't really want to be the, uh, the odd guy out. Yeah, you better, be, you better have a twenty two in hand. It was the thing that everybody had one. Okay. Why don't we take a minute and look at a couple of, you know, we don't need to see, I don't think we have time in the not year all, to look at all 1,200. All, no. so let's take a look at a couple of the, the specific, you know, uh, transitional important Yeah, I can models. show you the basic graduations, the, okay. the key players. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is one of the earlier examples that I want to show you. This is Simpsons, Simpson and Company's. That little 22 sporters. These are just little, look at, how, look at how dainty this is. They're all little 22s or little, you know, Floberts and so on and so forth. So here is the pre-militarized version of this. It's, okay. It has no, see, it's basic functions, basic safeties, dovetail sort of sights, or just really basic and kind of ugly however the 98k was the gun to have it was the gun it was the standardized military rifle how do we get everybody familiar with that we make it a law literally to have all of these guns look like a military so the stocks were changed bolts were changed rear sights were changed front sights were changed they had to go to tangent sights they had all these specifications and if you wanted to make money at the time you had better convert or you're going down. So Simpson being one of the only manufacturers to do this was the first one of the first on board. Well there's two. There is Walther with their sport model or their model fives and then Simpson came out with this. That earlier one was the immediate precursor to this one. This is the W six twenty five. Okay. which is that's looking a little more looking little a little more military style that's right that's right but it still it still has its you know clo a smaller loading port and right you've got the same style of safety yep but Opens. not a duplicate of the the mauser safety. correct and but the sa was in charge of of this rifle it was really the sa that was begging for a standardized rifle because they were put in charge of training not only the civilians but also the Hitler youth on how okay it was basically the boot camps the SA was in charge of boot camp they said well give us something that's like the 98k so everybody had to convert so the 625 was the really the first shot but the SA came back and said yeah, close, but no cigar. We needed a little bit closer. And Walther tried their hand at Walther Sport Models. And that was, you know, the, the two items that were brought to the table. And the essay said, no, we want it with this, 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 and this. And we want Mauser to be the ones to make it. So Mauser said, all right, well, we'll design it. Of course, it's the national, it's the right thing to do. It's the Nazi thing to do. And who are we to say no to a project that we're assigned with? So, 
all the other manufacturers in Germany at the time, in the Thuringen area, they had to be on board too or they were going to lose out and it's government money. So what do they do? Yes, lucrative contracts. Yes, so Mauser is all of a sudden assigned to manage the Deutsche Sport model or the DSM and here's one of the earliest ones and it's a little bit closer. Yeah. The, the, the loading port is one of the key giveaways and this was a 1934 design. Yeah looks very much like a Mauser bolt now. Yes, it's looking a lot closer. And the rear sight is also getting more similar to the, mm -hmm. the standard Mauser. Yep. As is, the, yeah, as is the front. Yes, however, where's the bayonet look? That's not there. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's not very cost effective to put that on there. And they're like, okay, well, maybe we can do without it. All right, and it's still... It doesn't duplicate the weight, does Yeah, it? the 10 year olds can handle this pretty well, but the big guys that are about to be recruited, they're like, oh, this little thing, you know, geez, this isn't, this isn't like what my brother told me the 98K is. So this went on for a little while. They kept trying to redesign. Oh, I got problems with the loading port. So by 1936 and the loading tray and, and so on and so forth. So by 1936, they brought it back to the drawing board, redesigned the receiver. Let me see his receiver redesign the receiver so it's not so straight cut you got a little bit of more movement in there it's beveled now but still that was not good enough Where, where's our bayonet look Where, where's our uh it's still too light well that's nice so right before the war 1938 <coughs> the SA was still complaining and Mauser frankly was a little tired of managing the whole and they had other stuff that they really had to get on boat with designing. So they all went back to the drawing board. Um, Gusloff, or BSW, Walther, and Mauser all met and said, okay, the SA wants this, what do you got? Well, I got a loading tray. Well, I got a better bolt design. Well, I got a better resources. I can head the whole project. So Mauser was kind of let go as the primary project leader. BSW was made the main project leader, and Walter had a big part in it. They s tried to sign other contracts to other little people, but the war was getting so close that the other contracts did not come in. It was just the three manufacturers of what was now called the KKW, the Klein Cal Caliber Bear Sports Gewehr. And that is one that we were looking at earlier is a spitting image of the, K of the K98K. I have to say, when I picked it up, yeah, if it weren't for that little tiny hole in the muscle, yes, this it's, one's, it's a dead ringer for a 98K. This one's heavier. Now, the 10-year-olds are going to have to build a little bit of muscle in order to get this. This is getting the light better here. This is wide open. Yep. And what's up front? Yeah, there's your bayonet lug. <laughs> there's my bayonet on. lug. And it's heavier. The stock is heavier. And these, <coughs> being laid later in the war, Walther was not part of that, Mauser is not part of it, but Gusloff utilized the concentration camp labor to assemble these guns. And then the quality starts dropping off, and it's very apparent. And Robert has, so like for instance, for the Gusloffs, for so it makes sense that Robert has the most Mauser DSMs, because Mauser was ahead of that, and he also has the most Gusloff KKWs, because they were in charge of that one. Okay. And, but still, intermittently, all the other little manufacturers, like Anschutz, they had to try, it was also, okay, so these were the standardized ones. These are the ones that the SA came back and said, yes, that's precisely what we asked for. Or, okay, we'll make do with that. But the other manufacturers still needed money because this one was being paid by the Nazi party. But all the civilians that couldn't necessarily pay for one of these big 98K versions, and they just wanted their boys to shoot on the weekends with little four millimeters, they still had to make those military style, but they're making other models outside of the standardized type so they actually had cash in pocket. Okay. 
yeah. a way to for the government to ensure that the whole arms industry was continuing to be supported financially. Correct. Correct. And if you wanted to, but, 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 if you wanted to shoot on the weekends to keep up with your little shooting records, your mandatory shooting time, you could only bring a standard model, standardized model. You couldn't bring a, a Walter Sport model. You couldn't bring a, you know, a Gecko Model 27 or... You couldn't, bring, you couldn't bring anything else. This was what was in the book. This, they showed you how to, in the HJ manual, how to operate the DSM. That better be the one that you're coming with. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Nicole, for uh, taking the time to show us through this. This is clearly a passion of yours, and it's, it's a fantastic project. I'm really looking forward to seeing the book when it's finished. Um, are you interested in receiving correspondence from other people who have questions or may have information about these rifles? I am. I'm... I am always open for for help. You know, I'm on a K98K forum. There's a small bore and conversion kits section on there. That's okay. if you are genuinely interested in these, or you're a student of these, researcher, or owner of one of these, because it's kind of a smaller niche. Definitely, um, it's got a lot of history, and it plays this huge part that people don't know about, and the importance of it's there. Um, but I'm always willing to help out with what I can. If you just picked one up or inherited one from your grandpa, and you don't know what the heck it is, I might chime in on the on the forum if I'm not otherwise You busy. can bet if I get one myself, I'll be sending pictures yeah. to you to find out what it is. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you very much. All I right. appreciate the time. Yep, thanks.